Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And on our panel tonight, the Conservative Defence Minister, Tobias Elwood, Labour's Shadow Foreign Secretary, Emily Thornberry, one of those talked about as a successor to Tim Farron as leader of the Liberal Democrats, Norman Lamb, the co-founder of the website Conservative Woman, Laura Perrins, and the writer and actor who joined the pro-Corbyn group Momentum just this week, Rob Delaney. Thank you very much. Just a reminder at home, you can join us on Twitter, on Facebook, our hashtag BBCQT, and text us on 83981, and if you push the red button on the zapper, you'll see what others are saying. Our first question from uh, Rachel Birmingham, please. Theresa May has said that we have lessons to learn after the Grenfell Tower disaster. Why haven't these lessons already been learnt? Tobias Elwood. Well, I think our first uh, reaction must be to say that our thoughts and prayers are with those who are caught up with this. It's a, an unfolding horror that we've been watching and continues uh, on our screens. And yet again, the emergency services have stood up to another huge disaster and have been extremely professional. And yet again, individuals stepped into harm's way to help other people evacuate that building. And yet again, a community has opened up its doors to support those who've been caught up in this. And yes, there are many, many, many questions uh, to be answered. And that is why she has called, the Prime Minister has called for a public inquiry. Now, we know that Parliament is not sitting at the moment, but MPs did meet today in the Grand Committee Room with the Housing Minister and indeed the Fire Authorities Minister. And right across the, uh, the House, people raise those questions about cladding, about alarms, about previous events that have taken place, and ask those questions, which no doubt we will look at today. And that is why we must have that full inquiry. But our immediate thoughts must be to su continue to support the emergency services, but also to support those caught up in this. Many of those left that building without anything, without their keys, without their mobile phones, without an identity card without the school uniform. They need immediate support. They won't have access to bank accounts. They won't have a roof over their head. So we need to look at that. Mm. There'll be others who will be concerned mm. as well about uh, high-rise buildings across the country too. And we need to make sure that they are looked after as well. And in the long term, absolutely, an inquiry must look as to why these questions that we're now raising and looking at were not answered in the past. Well, that's the question Rachel was asking, yes. And um, every time there's a disaster, People say lessons have to be learned. Emily Thornbury, why haven't the lessons already been learned? I mean, I think that the, there will, pe will be people in Southwark who, who went through that dreadful fire in the community in Southwark thinking, we waited years and years for there to be inquiries and then recommendations were made and the evidence on it seems to be that those recommendations were not necessarily acted on. The most important one being, I think, about making sure that we have up-to-date fire regulations that apply to modern materials and the way in which we are, um, you know, fitting out our, our blocks of flats right now. Now, I don't know the cause of the fire, and no one does at this stage, and it would be wrong to, to jump to conclusions. There are questions, there are lots of questions about retrofitting, about, about safety, about why it is that blocks of flats are supposed to be built in such a way that when there's a fire, it only spreads through a couple of units and the rest of the, the block is fine. Why has that not happened? But fundamentally, in the righteous anger that people feel on the ground is... You know, we know that there were recommendations to upgrade fire regulations. Why hasn't that happened? And yes, what I, just to see these pictures and to hear about you know, a woman on the eighth floor knowing that she is going to die and throwing her baby out of the window and hoping that it will live. I mean, it, we have not seen anything like this. We have not mm -hmm. seen a death toll like this since the Blitz. And 
it is about time that we turned the corner and started to look towards the need for good government, for a duty of care to people. People who live in blocks of flats now need to have pretty quick reassurance that their flats are safe so that they can you know, continue to live, but we need to upgrade our fire regulations. And this time, this time, we need to make sure that we listen to the recommendations and do something about it. Um, I work in the construction industry and have done for a few years and my fear would be whilst I completely agree it was it is and was traumatic and awful what happened is that there's already so many regulations to get any building work off the ground to get any civils work off the ground um, it's paper mad quite frankly and um, my concern is that you'll be focusing on that rather than maybe as well as that, you should be looking at um, the bottom line because whether we like it or not, these, price, these jobs are priced and when um, people get the choice, they are making the choice to use no. substandard materials and they are spending... No. Uh, little rather than yeah, the right but amount. that's why there have to be regulations because in the end people have to be forced but you're because safe. the bottom line is that people are safe where they live I, that's I the absolutely bottom line agree. and we have to make sure that people are held back from the profit mo motive and they essentially said we have to make sure that people are safe first and foremost you have to be safe in your home and that's why we what cannot was, simply allow the what, market what, to what let was your point what, how does I your agree, point but the, but you're saying we have to do this, we have to do that, but there are public sector work, and now I don't know if that one was, but there's public sector work where you have a lot of control over that element of the job, and that's not happening. OK. The, the woman up there at the very back there, with respect. Yes. Okay. Um, the average housing minister, I believe, since 2010, spent less than a year in the job. So is this a problem, rather than knowing what we need to do, not having the means to execute it because no minister has stayed in place that long? You know, how do you so solve that? How do you keep people in the job long enough to actually have an to effect? To know what they're doing. Laura Perrins. Well, I mean, what, what has happened at, at Grenfell Tower is absolutely tragic. Those scenes were, were just horrific to watch and, and knowing what might have been happening at the top floor. I mean, I don't think anybody could really disagree with anything that's been said so far. Of course, everybody wants their, their fellow neighbours to be living in safe homes. No, nobody would disagree with something like that. Of course, we need um, you know, ad adequate regulations to make sure that those, those sa safe homes happen. But I think if I was to venture further, um, and Emily, you have a London constituency and, and, and a lot of you are, I'm London based and mo most of you spend most of your time in London. I mean, the, the fact is, is that there is a massive housing shortage in London right now. And I think the crucial question is, yes, the cladding looked incredibly flammable and that might have been the key reason for why this tragedy has unfolded the way it has. But the, the bigger issue is, should those poor people have been in that high-rise tower block in the first place? It didn't, you know, it, it, it looked, it, the height no. for London is, extra, is extraordinary. It's, it's not a building design that is, is no. suited to, uh, no. No, to, to the UK, whereas, no. whereas perhaps it no. will be in the US. So the question is, is why were they in there in the first place? And, and part of the reason is there, there has been a huge housing shortage in London for a number of reasons. Um, I think it, it had, it's grown at twice the rate of the rest of the country. Um, so, you know, much stronger than what may have happened in Coventry. It doesn't mean and buildings people... have to be unsafe simply no, because they're large not. or tall. Because no, as you say, not. they're not tall. <laughs> That. But if this building, if, uh, it, it may come down to it that the inquiry says, you know what, there's no amount of regulations that ultimately could have made this building safe. I don't so the question then mm. is, no, should, should, should these poor people no, have been no, there no, in the no. first place? The, no. the person up there in the third row from the back, you say yes. I think one of the reasons why um, the residents of North Kensington are so angry is the Residents Association have continually yeah. tried to yeah. raise concerns <laughs> about <laughs> fire. Yeah. Okay. Rob, Rob Delaney. And the tenant management organisation and Kensington Borough Council have not done anything about it. What does it take to get the voice of the poor in this country heard? Yeah. Uh, I, I wish that the answer to your question, what does it take, wasn't the fire that just happened or disasters like that, because 
poor people are people and they <laughs> need somewhere to live and when you've got ambulance drivers you know who have to commute into London because they can't afford to live in London because they're being priced out and you know I know Corbyn called for people in Kensington who have empty homes to to open them up to people who have been displaced by this fire I mean you've just got to look at what the poverty does to people and how the systems that we have set up are geared to funnel wealth towards the top, towards the landlords, towards the people who vote against safety regulations when it serves them. And the fact is, is yeah, that's, this is what it takes, a conflagration that kills people and, and, and puts them in the cemetery. That, that's what it takes, unfortunately. Okay, you said that. Why is it that we still have unsafe buildings like this? And why have governments over many years and many previous governments failed to build enough housing for low-income families where they can safely live? Norman Lamb. Uh, well, you're absolutely right that uh, <clears throat> there is a serious concern about why lessons haven't already been learned. Uh, I think we should start, incidentally, by just offering our sincere condolences to the families who have been affected by this tragedy. I mean, it's just unimaginable what has happened. And when you heard the story about the Syrian man uh, <clears throat> talking to his family in Syria, uh, but knowing that his life was about to end, it, it's just hard to get your head around this. Uh, and I think one of the things that we need to ensure is that there is ongoing support for everyone who's been traumatised by this event, because there will be very many people who suffer significantly as a result of what they've been through. But just think about this. Regulations require hotels to have sprinkler systems throughout but not tower blocks. How can you possibly justify that? And I would also make this point. I'm pleased that the Prime Minister has called for a public inquiry to take place, but there are some things that can't wait for a public inquiry. And there will be people around our country in inner cities living in tower blocks, about 4,000 of them around the country, who will be now very worried about their safety and the needs as a matter of urgency to be a check, a full check done on all of those blocks to make sure that they are safe. One just final point, uh, David. Uh, I, I spent some time talking to a former chief fire officer today and he said that what happened in that block should just never have happened. The yeah. extent to which the fire spread from exactly. units that should have contained the fire into corridors, into stairwells and so on. This has all the hallmarks of a major scandal yes. and it's really important we get to the bottom right. of it. Yes. And, um, <laughs> Let me just finally go back to the questioner, Rachel Birmingham. Uh, you've heard what's been said here. What's your, what's your view about lessons not being learned? Well, plainly I'm pleased there is going to be a presumably a wide-ranging inquiry, but I'm just very disturbed that here we are in the 21st century and it appears that things like political ideology, um, the, the quest for profit, and even general things like the aesthetics of the buildings, so that the people living around yeah, exactly. that flat, that block of flats... Yeah, millions of pounds has been spent let, on the cosmetic look of the building, yes, not let, on let people's safety. Let her speak. Let her speak. Yeah. 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 Let her speak. And, and the gentleman who, who made the point about who speaks for those tenants, who mm. speaks for the, the tenants of social housing who appear to have so very few rights and so very few um, protective laws around them um, to, to save their lives. We don't know what the loss of no. life is, but it just seems unacceptable that we've allowed all these other issues to actually have much higher priority than yep. the safety of people. Agree. Oh, OK. I'm not going to stop there, I think... I think Thank you very much. I think we, we, we know that there's going to be an inquiry. We know there's a call for an inquiry from the Mayor of London this summer, an immediate first inquiry. Um, I think on that note we'll move on. Um, I'm not sure we can add much at this stage. I just, should I say, a uh, question I'm going to be in Plymouth next week, I have to say that, and Hastings the week after. Details of how to apply are on the screen. So let's, uh, let's go on to a, 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 a question from... Mark Hudson, let's have your question. Mark Hudson. Will we now see our wibbly-wobbly leader do a U-turn over a hard Brexit? After the election, will we see our wibbly-wobbly leader, I can't think who you're thinking of, do a U-turn over a hard Brexit? Uh, Rob Delaney. I would hope so. I mean, she said that 
if she lost six seats that she wouldn't that she wouldn't be able to do it and she lost 13 which is six times two plus one so that's a lot less so what she set out to do with the election was a, a failure uh, did conservatives win the most seats yes they absolutely did nobody disputes that um, but she she didn't achieve what she set out to do so yeah her mandate has has failed and so uh, yeah is the, that's the answer but is the, Brexit, is the uh, attitude to Brexit and leaving the EU going to change as a result? Well, a majority of people voted for Brexit, so that's what happened. I can't vote here because I'm not a citizen. I would have voted against it, but that's not what happened. So people have voted for Brexit, so it looks like Brexit's going to happen. But is it going to happen the way Theresa May had hoped it would? Uh, let's hope it doesn't because of what just happened with the election. Okay. I mean, the uh, Emily Thornbury, how do you think it's going to be affected by the election? Well, I think that she called this election out of hubris. I think that she thought that she could stamp out the opposition. I think that she thought that she could have an election whereby she'd be allowed to do whatever she liked with this country when it came to Brexit. And the people said no. And they said no because they did not want to have this kind of reckless way in which she was behaving, standing on the steps of number 10 Downing Street and stamping her feet and saying that uh, the Europeans were conspiring against us. Listen, we need to leave the European Union. Of course we do. But she has now returned without the majority that she needs. And what we need to do is she needs to start listening to people properly. And what people are saying is that they, yes, we leave the European Union, but we need to have a way in which we leave the European Union whereby we look after the economy and we look after jobs. And that is the most important thing that we do. And hopefully they will start listening because they do not have the mandate. I mean, look at the chaos, right? They're so chaotic, they can't even put together a Queen's speech. And yet they're supposed to be negotiating on Brexit on Monday. You know, they can't agree on the, what mm. the government stands for. Mm. Normally you have a situation where a Prime Minister would go into a general election, if, if they won it, they would have a manifesto and they'd be putting it into, into force in the Queen's speech. Mm. We have no idea what's going to be in the Queen's speech because they haven't agreed with the DUP but, yet mm. exactly what it is, or her backbenchers, as to where it is that the government is going but by I, way of I, direction. We'll come to the DUP. I don't want to stir things up, Emily. You know no. me well enough. No, I wouldn't no, dream no, of, of doing that. No. But when you say the government doesn't know what it's going to do, it, I was just thinking what Labour wants to do about the EU, and yeah. you don't seem to know either, because you say... Well, the I <laughs> let, me just, let, me, sorry, let me just give you the tip. You, you say the idea of leaving the single market and the customs union worries me a great deal. I think it could be reckless. John McDonnell says continued membership of the single market isn't respecting the referendum. So you and John McDonnell are two senior figures in the Labour Party. Okay. So, okay. so, okay. So, the, so the Labour position. So the Labour position is this: is we leave the European Union. We, as leaving the European Union, it means we need to leave the single market. But our position has been throughout that our priority has to be the safety and security of our citizens, and then the economy. It means that we need to have red tape-free, tariff-free access to the single market because we need to be looking after the the, the economy more than anything else. So, and sorry, did you did you position. not say the idea of leaving the single market worries you a great deal and could be reckless? I think it depends... Did you well, say that? I don't remember saying well, that. There you are. All right. <laughs> the, the question is, the question has always been how we leave the European Union. And the fact is, is that the, the Tories have been saying that they are quite happy to leave the European Union without there being any deal at all. That means not having access to the single market. And frankly, that worries me. That kind of recklessness worries me. And that kind of let's turn our back on the customs union also worries me. Because it seems to me that that is not a good future for no. Britain. And it undermines our economy. And when it undermines our economy, it means our kids do not get jobs. Okay. <laughs> Tobias uh, Elwood, is the, is the attitude to negotiation with the EU inevitably going to change because of your not having a majority in the House of Commons? Well, let's be clear. The election, it's a good start. The election, <laughs> the election didn't you go always well. say that. The election be clear. didn't go well. Yeah. Uh, it, we made mistakes. And the Conservative Party needs to take stock. It needs to regroup. It needs to recognise uh, where we need to learn. And that's exactly the process that we're going to go through now. We didn't engage as we should have done with the youth. Incredibly, 600 thousand people signed up on the last day of registration. I'm not sure why that happened. It's great that the youth are engaging in politics, but we didn't engage with them. And if they are now to participate, I was president at my students' union uh, at university. It was really tough to get them involved in politics. 
They are involved in politics now. I don't think the Mark is asking party, about this. I'm sorry to interrupt party, you. Mark, Mark Hudson, no, he, he says, will the wibbly-wobbly leader do a U-turn over hard Brexit? You didn't so, ask you whether young people were voting. That's a different question. Yeah. Well, to then make it clear, the... The term hard Brexit or soft Brexit, these aren't government terms. These are things that the media or other people... I don't understand what that terminology is. Let's just... <laughs> let's just... Take stock. We want a good deal, and I'm confident that we will get that deal. But we have to have that option of backing away if there's not a good deal. But I'm confident that we will. And sometimes we belittle Britain as well. We don't actually push forward to say what deal, what have we got to offer. When it comes to telecoms, when it comes to pharmaceuticals, when it comes to the creative industries, when it comes to oil and gas or financial services or infrastructure or policing, intelligence or defence, we are the best in Europe, are going to be the best in the world. We have a lot to offer at these negotiations and I believe let those talks commence and allow us to get that good deal which will be good for Britain. OK. You said in front. Maybe if the Tory party that I voted for didn't have a wibbly-wobbly leader in the first place, then we'd get a better deal. Because Theresa May hasn't engaged with anyone. Yeah. She went to Grenfell Tower. She yeah, didn't yeah, speak to any yeah. residents. How's that engaging? Well, there are reasons for that <laughs> specifically to have happened. There's security uh, concerns that were made in there. She's made it very, very clear. Jeremy we're going back to this to question residents. there. But absolutely, she is now moving forward and making it clear. And I put my hand up to say, we made mistakes in that. This was not a good election for the Conservative Party. Right. But the result I'll, is such but I'll never that vote, we are, I'll never vote we are Tory commanded again while to actually Mays form leader. a government, which is what we're doing with the, the DUP, and now we then must move forward. And the Brexit yeah. discussions will begin on Monday, as has been indicated. But do you say you'd never vote? I'll, I've, I've always voted Tory, but I'll never vote Tory again while Theresa May is well, she may not. She may not. You may not have to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure Brenda in Bristol would want another election anytime soon. Norman Lamb. Well, uh, Theresa May's changed her mind on having an early election. She's changed her mind within days, do you remember, of the budget when she increased tax on those who are self employed. Uh, and then she changed her mind on the dementia tax halfway through an election campaign within days of the launch of their manifesto, which is unprecedented. So it doesn't give me enormous confidence about the way in which she's going to conduct these absolutely vital negotiations and isn't it a rich irony that we had all of the mantra about strong and st stable leadership about the coalition of chaos and here Theresa May is now negotiating a coalition of chaos with the DUP from Northern Ireland and I'll tell you this I think it is incumbent upon all members of Parliament who were elected last week now to act in the national interest. We have to do what we can to negotiate the best possible deal for this country. And that means recognising, and I don't think Theresa May has begun to do that yet, recognising what happened last week and recognising that she has to work with other parties across Parliament <laughs> to do the best deal. How, just and, before, and, you go on, just, before you go on on that, how would that? Ex what are you exactly saying? How would that work? Well, I mean, across first, party. First, I mean, first of all, it's... sworn enemies, all of you. Well, but I think we have a responsibility to change the way we behave, don't we? And I think we will. <laughs> and I think we would let down the people of this country in a profound way if we simply act in a tribal way throughout the course of this Parliament. We've got William Hague now calling for cross-party working. We've got David Cameron even calling for it. John Major. Uh, there are lots of serious... They're all calling for softer Brexit. They, 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 they are, say but they are party. also recognising the importance of talking to other people. I've been trying to argue the case for this sort of approach with the NHS and the care system for the last 18 months, getting nowhere so far. And look what happens when Theresa May does it on her own on the dementia tax, a total omnishambles. All right, well, let's come so back. Let's, let's do it in a sensible way, Let's leave way, the, those issues. We'll with stick with people. Brexit, because that's the thing that's uh, happening, what, in two days' time or whatever it is, three days' time? You in the front there. Going to ensure a successful Brexit when the EU seem to be dictating the time scale. We're then not going to discuss trading um, before they discuss the divorce, essentially. Laura Perrins. Well, I mean, you can never dictate to the other side what their negotiating position will be. I mean, it's interesting to hear, in relation to 
whether Brexit should happen. Of course Brexit should happen. They should respect the referendum results. That's the first point. The second point is Norman is free to um, get together a cross-party group if he wants in Parliament as long as they understand what the referendum re result was and they implement Brexit as both parties, as both, as bo well, fantastic, as both Labour and the Conservatives, both Labour and the Conservatives in the last election put in their manifestos that Brexit meant um, leaving the single market and leaving the customs union. I think it was on page 28 of the Labour uh, manifesto that said free movement will end when we leave the EU. Do you so recognise softer and harder Brexit as concepts like David Cameron and John Major do or do you think there's only one kind no, of Brexit. There's only one kind of Brexit. That's why Labour put ending free movement in their manifesto. That was the same with the Conservatives. So, the so what main, is David Cameron the saying? Two main Sorry, parties. The, what is Cameron saying when he says there's pressure for a softer Brexit and Major saying a hard Brexit is increasingly unsustainable. That doesn't mean anything well, to you at all. Well, there's pressure for a softer Brexit from people who want a softer Brexit. The pressure is generated by people like David Cameron. No, he never it's, wanted it's, it's, the to be, referendum to succeed. To I mean, be fair, it's pressure it's, from people who want to protect our economy and our yeah. jobs Norman, and our every, ability to pump ev our public Everybody service. wants to protect jobs and the economy. But, but if we walk Greece away May from wants... trading arrangements that do our country a lot of good, then we will do damage to our economy. Look, look, Norman, there is a deal that we can do, which is in which the is interests what? of the economy. But it, well, can't, it can't mean remaining in the customs union and single full, market. Full, you agree full, on that? Full access to the single market. Well, that would be access, great. Let's do uh, it. Remaining in the customs union, but certainly that, that for a period of that's not even or the, the EU. Or the election. It, and that's it, not been got from the, yeah. the people paid. of Britain. Right. We're bringing, we're bringing, June. We have a government minister here. We're bringing him in and on this. No, hang on, hang on, Norman. Do you recognise the distinction between hard and soft Brexit? Do you side with David Cameron on this? No, I'm asking you for that definition because there's well, no, he, I'm, a I'm not definition. Defining, he, he said I'll, I'll clarify, if I can clarify what the government's position is, and then you can then tell me if that is hard or soft. It's very clear, first of all, in answer to the question, which was very pertinent, what is the timetable? Well, that's locked down because that's part of Article 50 itself. But as I articulated before, we should be very proud of, of who we are. Fifth uh, largest economy in the world. You've said all this one before. Of the, one of the Come to the issue. But it's worth, worth reminding ourselves. Yeah, no, you said it only five and minutes ago. Happen. Nobody's it's got good 19th, memories here. Yeah. On the 19th of June, what will happen is that they will sit down and then go through all the issues that we've got there. And Emily was right. When it comes to control mm. of laws, of money and border, that is what the result of the EU no, referendum... I didn't that. Hello, I never said that. OK, well, the, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, I said, I said we need to have, we need to have tariff-free access to the single market. That's what I said. You guys are the ones who are prepared to sacrifice the economy because you've got this well, fixation about now the European you're putting words Board of Justice. Mouth. The result of the referendum was clear that the nation wants to see Britain take back control of its laws, its money and its borders itself. And what will happen as, as negotiations begin is that week by week we will go through in a methodical manner away from the theatre of, of, of all the comments that have been made at the moment and go through. So EU citizenship working in, in the UK, Britain's working abroad. They will look at that. They will okay. look at Northern Ireland borders. They will look at financial services and the passporting rights. Working their way through all the differences and that will end up, I hope, towards a good deal for Britain. Right, let's hear from some members of... And members of our audience who got their hands up, you say in purple there, and then I come to the woman there in blue. Yes. Will the Conservatives be sacrificing freedom of movement for access to the single market? What do you think? I hope no, but you never know because there's, well, there's been no shortage of U-turns lately, has there? What do you that. want? Um, I, think, I don't think we should, no. I think we shouldn't sacrifice freedom of movement. Um, I do believe, you know, that we should have the final say over who comes here. And that should be a sticking point for us. So you should only be people who fit with British values. All right. And, and you in the centre, the woman in blue there. Yeah, it does seem to me that the Conservatives need to take a more socially responsible viewpoint. Uh, Laura said David Cameron never wanted Brexit to succeed. She's told Norman he can form a cross-party <laughs> alliance to, to deal with Brexit. Actually, Theresa May should be reaching out to the other parties. Totally agree. Yeah, on, 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 on to implement what the people said, though. OK, and no, you, not, sir, Not to there. implement what the Lib Dems say, yeah, to no, implement no. the election but result and the referendum result, both of which said that people want to leave the European Union and take back control right. of their borders and hold their on, finances. Hold on, hold on, panel. We'll hear from one or two more members of the audience. You in spectacles there on the left. Uh, right, Labour and the Lib Dems keep saying we want, we want, we want. 
from the EU regarding the deal, whereas the Conservatives are willing to walk away if we don't get anything. Yeah. So are you guys willing to sell us down the river if the EU doesn't give us what we but want? The, uh, hang well, on. Wait, it's, very, let me, let me... it's very interesting that the... It's very interesting that we haven't heard much from the Conservatives, this idea of no deal being better than a bad deal. Because just let's all be very clear, no deal is a disaster for this country. A disaster economically, and it means damage to jobs and our ability to fund our public services. There is a lot at stake here. And if we walk away from deals that enable our exporters to trade across a single market of 500 million consumers, we would be doing this country a grave right. injustice. Is no deal a disaster? Well, for fear just, of, of just, you shouting at me again for going through the third time, I'm confident that we will get uh, a good deal. Uh, I'm absolutely why? confident because right. of the position that we actually have. Can you David Cameron may have a view on this, but it isn't his view that's actually important right now. It is the view of the nation. I'll make it clear, I'll declare, it's very clear, I voted to remain in the European Union. I think it massively needed reform. It wasn't competitive, it wasn't, compa uh, it wasn't accountable, uh, and it, it wasn't transparent. But I did vote there, and I have to accept the result as a parliamentarian and as a Democrat, that the nation itself has called for something else Dubai, that I didn't Dubai, agree with. Dubai, and where, remaining, what, in what if circumstances, just, uh, Emily, if in what just circumstances can I may, rem, would no can I deal be point? better? I need, need to just tell my us, point. what can deal I would be so bad my point? that actually having no deal can at I all my point? Would, be, would be better? Can I finish my point? Why not speed up and then answer her point? <laughs> What I'm, what I'm saying is, is that the deal that we're actually looking for, we have the competence and confidence that we will get that good deal. But we can't remain a member of the single market, which is what the Liberal Democrats want, because that would not be leaving the European Union, and that is what the... Why okay, no, no, all right, no, just, I'm going to, come, to uh, I'm going to come, come back to our audience uh, in just a moment, but just answer, if you would, that simple question, is no deal better than a bad deal? That's what the Prime Minister said, and that's absolutely. You. But I'm saying too much airtime is given to this because we have the confidence, well, said, uh, David said Davis that. and others, to say that we, I'm con confident, that we yes, will get yes. a, a good What's, deal. What does a bad right. deal look like, then, that, you'd be, that it would be better to have no deal at all? Just tell us. Spell it out. Again, what, are you, what are you talking about when you say Because it's a great soundbite, but what does it really we're mean? We're speculating on those talks and the agreements, and I just gave an indication as to how those talks will commence weekly going through each of those issues one by one. And so you I have no answer? It's, an, it's not that I don't have you any have answer. No answer. I think you're, you're trying to speculate I'm not trying on, to speculate. I'm trying to understand what you... Let them go you keep the using the sandbite. begin those talks. We, the people right. deserve to be told what it really means. Well, you are going to know tonight, are you? So let's go on to the man in purple there in the T-shirt and then I go back up to the back there. The back. I think... Yes. The panel needs to clarify what they actually mean by hard Brexit, soft Brexit. I think in my mind it comes back know. to it's a media term used for those that voted to remain and those that <laughs> voted to leave. And in reality, if we don't leave the European Union, the single market, the customs union and its associated bodies, we're not actually leaving the European Union. And therefore, exactly. soft Brexit. OK. <laughs> and and uh, the person up there, the second, at the very back there, you, sir. Yes. It seems to me that in the last election there were two main issues. One was Brexit and one, and one was the anti-austerity manifesto of the Labour Party. And it seems to me the Remainers are underplaying the effect of the anti-austerity manifesto in getting people to vote that way. And that's not really being talked about. Enough. You think it's being interpreted as a Remainer vote when in fact it was an anti-austerity vote, is what you're saying? Absolutely, yes. There right. was a very big anti vote. OK. Uh, let, let's, let's take an, another element of this. Unless, Rob, do you want to come in on this after what you've... Uh, no, I just I think that that's a very sage point, because I've lived here for not, not yet three years. And so, I mean, from my fresh eyes, seeing Brexit happen and then seeing this election happen, I think the Labour manifesto was a massive part of that, because people were very tired of austerity. Theresa May herself said that austerity is over, which means that austerity was a political choice, which is terrifying. That's terrifying to hear that from your leader's mouth. So I think that you are correct. I think okay. living in our means actually is a good thing, and that is something that we just strive for. But it's recognised that the nation uh, has been worn down by austerity. There's no doubt about it. Anne McMahon. Anne McMahon, please. Have the Tories undermined their credibility by getting into bed with the DUP? Laura Perrins. 
Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, this is a um, this is a deal that they are constitutionally entitled to enter. Um, the Conservatives have 317 seats, I believe, much greater than Labour's 262. Um, and the DUP have 10 seats. If there is a confidence and supply agreement, and I, I believe that's the term, it's not going to be something like a full coalition, it, it puts them two seats over. Um, so it's something that they're, they're perfectly entitled to do. I think the country needs stability. Um, and it's, it's the right thing to do at the moment. They have to have a stable government going forward and going into, um, going into those, those Brexit talks. I think the demonisation of the DUP um, lately has been over the top. I think it's been quite unseemly and it's been quite bullying in places. Um, and I think it's something that they should go ahead and do for the good of the country. Okay. Yes, you there, the woman there in the... In the in, uh, no, the woman behind you, yes. Yeah. Both the DUP and the Conservative man manifestos for this general election emphasised a need for an immigration policy which catered more towards skilled workers. Um, I struggle to understand how, representing a body that's supposedly for women, you can support this policy. All right, Laura Behrens. Well, I did read the DUP at Manifesto, and, and um, it's quite short. I, I, I'm interested to hear that you have as well. And they had some interesting things in there, including that I'm sure Emily would have supported, including retaining the triple lock pension, um, uh, also um, re retaining the, the universal winter fuel payments. Um, I mean, uh, you can tell from my accent the DUP wouldn't be my natural party, but um, it, was, it was quite an interesting... If you, if, it, it was a, it was a pro-unionist uh, manifesto from their point of view, and it was a pro-jobs uh, uh, manifesto. Um, I know they want a fluid border with the Republic, and uh, they want access to the single market. I think your, your point was in relation to that they wanted... Um, they were focusing on skilled jobs. Is, is, yes, is that right? Um, Amnesty International conducted research last year just yes. only last year that claimed that women across even in Europe after they fleed war-torn countries are still facing assault on a daily basis okay well I don't I mean, understand uh, how you can support you know as someone who represents a woman's movement how you can support both part you know the conservatives with their immigration policy for you know mm. limiting it to only skilled vetted workers so right. there are the women just be brief on this the really we'll important, the right. really important point it. to yeah. make is, is to make the an immigration policy work for the host country so okay. obviously if you need skilled immigrants then they mm. should be they should be entitled to enter and if women need to be further skilled then that's something that governments can focus on all right let's come back to the issue of uh, whether the tories are undermining their credit credibility by getting into the bed, as Anne McMahon put it, with the DUP. Um, Tobias Elwood. Well, the result of the election was clear for everybody to see. We didn't do enough to uh, seek the, uh, the full support of, of the nation on, on our own, uh, but we are the largest party, and therefore, even if it had been another party, they would also seek to uh, join forces in order to make sure that we do have uh, a government. Would, and working, the DUP, working the focus, just point the point. Would, it's not the, the mm. first time. There is a precedent that mm. uh, other parties, including Gordon Brown, I think, toyed with the idea of working with the DUP as well. But we make it very, very clear that there are two separate manifestos here. It doesn't mean to say these manifestos are merging. It's not going to be like the coalition with the Liberal Demo Democrats. This is a confidence of supply. It's allowing the nation of, of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland to continue on. But it also is separate to the Northern Ireland talks themselves of getting the Northern Ireland executive moving forward. So you had Gavin Williamson, our uh, chief whip, discussing how we can work together with the DUP to form that government. And separately, you have James Brockenshire, who's continuing his work to make sure that the Northern Ireland executive, along with the work with the Irish government and others, uh, uh, other stakeholders in Northern Ireland themselves, can actually get the Northern Ireland uh, executive running again. Was it actually again. necessary? Because would the DUP have voted against the Tories and forced an election? I or, think given, or given Jeremy Corbyn a chance to form a government? Is it likely the DUP would have done that? I, I, I hate to use this word of, of, of stable government. It's been slightly overused during this election. But the result I mean, is what it is. You think they would? You and think they we, might have? No, but we do need to provide that assurance to the nation that voted, uh, didn't give us the full authority to do that, 
in order to make, make sure that we can move forward, not least because the Brexit okay. discussions are starting actually next week. But it does not mean that our, our manifestos or our, uh, what we believe in actually then overlap. Quite separate parties, and that continues. All right. The woman up there in the third row from the back. Okay, I think you're missing something much more fundamental. She might be entitled to actually join in with um, the Democratic Unionist Party, but as, as an Irish woman, I grew up in, our, in Northern Ireland. I was a student in, at Queen's University in the Troubles, and I was a social worker there as well. I saw people traumatised by bombs. We've just watched people being equally traumatised in, in Manchester and London by bombings, and yet this process, this alliance with DUP, how can she be a broker for the peace process in Northern Ireland mm. and actually be part of that? No, 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 no. I absolutely, I absolutely agree with the point you've made, and it's embedded in the Good Friday Agreement that the government must act as an independent arbiter between absolutely. nationalists and uh, and unionists. So, what should they have done? Let's come to the, well, the issue that was raised by Anne McMahon. Well, I, th I, I think I go back to the point I made earlier uh, in, in response to what Anne has said that we ought to be prepared not as a government of national unity, but to work across party, genuinely. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, but mm. I just, I just mm. want to complete this point. They're playing with fire here. And you've gone through the troubles in Northern Ireland and all the trauma that came as a result of that. But to take one side in this powder keg, I think, is immensely dangerous we're, and we're irresponsible. I think the answer, Anne, is that they have undermined their credibility, and I'll tell you why. Because the government has a responsibility to be an independent arbiter in relation to Northern Ireland. And Tobias said that Gordon Brown tried to seek some sort of alliance with the DP. That simply isn't true. What happened was, was that after the 2010 election, when no party got a majority, the, the Labour Party tried to speak to all parties in Northern Ireland and get a cross-Northern Ireland agreement, because in Northern Ireland, it's all based on trust. The Good Friday Agreement is based on trust. That's its motor. And if you start talking behind closed doors to one group and not to another, that undermines credibility. Now, James Brokenshire is supposed to be bringing powers back to Northern Ireland and be an independent arbiter at the same time as relying on one side to give him the very power in order to be able to do that. That is reckless behaviour and it is undermining the peace process in Northern Ireland. And frankly, that is an international treaty, and the government ought to be taking it a bit more seriously than they are. So, Leaving aside yes. anything that the DUP may stand for politically or anything else, it is simply the structural problem that we have a responsibility to keep pushing forward the Northern Ireland peace agreement, and frankly, this alliance is going to undermine it, and I am very concerned. We're about to have the marching season. You know, if, for example, the Parades Commission came back to the Secretary of State and said it would be contrary to public order for a parade to go through this particular street or down into this particular area and the DUP were pushing for it, the Secretary of State would be in a very embarrassing and difficult position. Well, in a, what way would he be able to make a decision? This is where we are, and the Tories have put us there. All right, what... All right. I'll come to you. What... Given that they don't have a majority in the House of Commons, you disapprove of what they've done to yeah. keep government going as they see it. What should they have done? I think they should have, they should have gone forward as a minority government. They should have put forward their Queen's speech and got on with it. And they should have seen what happened and whether or not they could get sufficient support for a Queen's speech. And, I mean, obviously, it's difficult. They're going to have to negotiate with their backbenchers or all giving up on their manifesto as fast as anything. But they would need to put forward a, 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 a Queen's speech that people could agree on. And if they didn't get that agreement, then, you know, they would need to work on a little more. And then if they were incapable, then, frankly, we are waiting in the wings and we will step up and we will be the alternative government. I'll come to that one in a moment. Yes, 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 sir. Boys, for the last three elections, I've voted for Conservatives and a staunch supporter, but even I can't support this, what's happened with the DUP. Yeah. It is completely irresponsible. Laura, you say the country needs stability. Where is the stability in this arrangement? Yeah. The country needs unity. The country would completely um, accept Verifying. some kind of cooperation, mm. exactly. I think, exactly. between exactly. Conservatives and Labour. Why is that completely off the agenda? We need unity. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thanks very much. I would love to think that some arrangement that's been suggested here would actually work. In, in practice, in the House of Commons, we would lose many, many votes for, for, for different reasons. And I hear what you say about the DUP. And to, to the lady who's from Northern Ireland, I served in Northern Ireland myself. And it was the most terrifying time. I've served in different parts of the world. But I didn't enjoy it. The, 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 the feeling of distrust there was absolutely huge. So the importance that's placed on the Good Friday Agreement I absolutely agree with, but and I would not want to do. This deal, and I, well, because I do not believe, unlike yourselves, which I think are slightly making a political point here, that actually it is in threat. It's, it's quite separate, and, realistic and we are not us. joining forces. We are quite independent of the work that we're doing Conflict to make sure interest. the Northern yeah. Ireland executive can actually continue on and also make sure that we honour the Good Friday Agreement as well. All right. Rob Delaney. Rob, Rob Delaney. It's, it's a conflict of interest. Say, Rob Delaney. Absolutely. Hang on, Norman. The difference is... Let, can let, I let, no, you can't. Let okay. Rob Delaney speak, please. Sorry. <laughs> it's very important that the American comedian be heard on this. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say, Tobias, that I very sincerely hope that you're correct. The, the word that jumped out at me earlier was structural. Uh, you know, we can wish that it'll work, we can hope that it would work, but it does sound like a conflict of interest because it is a conflict of interest. Yes, so exactly. it is, it's a very precarious mm. situation, so I just hope everyone is extraordinarily careful. Uh, they're, okay. they're also, incidentally, unreliable partners. They don't turn up half the time. Uh, and, and many of them have quite extreme right-wing views. They're hostile to women's rights, as has already been said, and to the rights of gay and lesbian people. Yeah, so okay, this is I'm a dangerous deal. OK, uh, we'll just uh, f finish this off fair dues with this question from Julian Clement Bromley, please. Yes, uh, can Jeremy Corbyn form a credible government if the Conservatives implode? If the Conservatives implode, can... Well, this is what uh, Emily Thornberry was saying a moment ago, that they stand ready. Um, mm. Tobias Elwood, if the Tories implode, you'll say they won't, but if they do, do you think Jeremy Corbyn could form, under the present circumstances, a credible government? I mean, we have to congratulate Jeremy Corbyn. He did an incredible job. I mean, a year ago, the Mirror, the London Mayor, and all the MPs, were, his own MPs, were seeking to get rid of him, and he's managed to unify them. I don't know how long... That will actually last. I think Labour is in a very precarious position because many of them were hoping to flush out Jeremy Corbyn in this election and then move on to perhaps the more moderate Labour, the sort of Blairite model. So they're stuck with Jeremy Corbyn and they're also stuck with a, a manifesto which talks about nationalisation, which talks, takes Britain into a very, very different place as well. Can when you, when many of us remember the, the 1980s. So I question? don't believe he's in a position to form a government. I think he did right. well in this, in this election because there was an anti-establishment vote and absolutely he harnessed the youth vote in a way that we have to learn how to do. But I actually, given his views, on, and particularly his views on security of Britain, I think he would be dangerous Okay, the woman there in the middle. <laughs> yes. I voted uh, Conservative previously. I voted Labour this time because I'm fed up of spin. Okay. And Jeremy Corbyn actually speaks, I believe, from the heart rather than sound bites. No, okay. I, 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 I want to hear from the American comedian, as he described himself, who just joined Momentum. Yeah, I did. Yeah, well, I was just so impressed. I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists in the United States, and uh, when I saw the Labour Manifesto, I'd always liked Corbyn. I understood that there were some people in Labour who thought that he doesn't wear a tie, and so maybe he could be Prime Minister. But I, I, I couldn't quite understand why people weren't supporting him. And then when the manifesto came out, people really rallied behind him because it made a tremendous amount of sense. So could he, would he be able to form a government? I, I think that he could. I mean, the polls, you know, if we looked at what happened to conservative polls in the lead-up to the election and then where they are now with the YouGov poll that came out today, the answer is, could he form a government? Yeah, he absolutely could if they had another vote today. Would everybody be happy with it? Of course not. But okay. to answer your question, could he form a government? Absolutely. Okay. Laura Perrins. Well, I mean, if, if, if 
the Conservatives are unable to form a, a, a government then again constitutionally it goes back to, uh, to Labour to put one together but on only 262 seats they don't really have a mandate for the manifesto and especially considering it was such a radical manifesto I can understand why it appealed to people um, like, like yourself and I think um, Jeremy Corbyn worked very effectively on the ground and through social media I personally like Theresa May I think she's a dignified individual but clearly it may be that she is a politician suited to a, a, a previous era in that she just finds it difficult to connect with you know your ordinary your ordinary person but I mean let's be let's be very clear that a manifesto that called for a 50 I think would be a borrowing of a further 50 billion pounds on top of a national debt which is already mm. 1.8 I, I trillion. I don't want to go into the no, no, policy no, I'm sorry no, but the, the question is about it, I, I, now given the circumstances I told, I said without constitutionally, an election. Constitutionally Constitutionally, it, it is their well, turn. But remember, credible is the word. I, mean, goes, I don't I, think it would be credible. I, I, I don't. Right. It's, it's, they don't have the mandate. It's too radical a manifesto, okay. and I think ultimately it would genuinely destroy this economy, plunging future generations into untold okay. amounts of Thank debt. You. Is morally no, wrong. No. I want to. I want to try and get one one last question in before we finish. But Norman Lamb, just on this, without an election, could Jeremy Corbyn form a government? Just be brief on it, if you uh, would. I don't think he's got the numbers uh, to do so. Uh, that's the brutal and honest answer to it. I, I think Jeremy Corbyn fought a dignified campaign, actually, and I agree with the point you make about politicians telling it straight. Uh, I think they are absolutely sick and tired of this uh, soundbite approach, you know, the strong and stable leadership repeated by every person in the cabinet <laughs> every time they're on air. It just drives people... Uh, crazy. I mean, it's, let's just be more straightforward and tell it straight to people. I think then you would get a, a, a bit of an increase in trust in politics. OK. Emily Thornbury, I wonder what your answer will be. I think that uh, if the Tories collapse and are unable to govern this country as things currently are, then we will step up and we will put forward a Queen's speech and we will put forward a budget and it will be up to members of Parliament from other parties to support us or not. And if they decide not to support us, then they will need to go back to their constituents and explain how it is that they've let the Tories back in again. And if it doesn't work, then unfortunately we will need another election. And are you, in, think, are you in favour of another election? But, I, I mean, mean, John McDonnell, I quoted him earlier, wanting a million people on the streets of London to ensure an election comes but as I soon think, as possible. Well, I mean, so, Labour so, policy? So what I'm trying to say is the steps that would need to be taken. And I think that we'd have to go through those steps. And that if, it was, if we were at a complete impasse, then we would have an election and Labour would win. And the reason we would win is because we have a vision for Britain and the Tories do not. And they are exhausted and they have no idea about where they want to take us. And we have a clear idea. And we have a clear idea about where Britain's future is and we are fed up. We are fed up with... We are fed up with, with yet, yet more and more cuts to public services um, on the altar of if we can just cut a bit more, then somehow or other our economy will get going again. It will not. It will not. We need to move forward and we need to try a new approach. And we have a fully costed manifesto and we have an alternative vision right. and we just Thank want you. the chance to serve. Thank you. Um, we've got four or five minutes left. We've got a, a question from Angara Dunkley. That I'd just like to end with, Mr. Dunk. Um, Ms. Dunk. <laughs> Ms. Dunk. Does the panel agree that Tim Farron has been treated very unfairly in regards to his personal religious views? T Tim Farron, of course, resigned yesterday as leader of the Liberal Democrats, saying, I quote him, to be a leader and to live as a committed Christian and to hold faithful to the Bible's teaching has felt impossible for me. Was he treated unfair? Uh, Norman Lamb, you come in. Are you going to stand for the leadership, by the way? Uh, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> no. Uh, 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 you you no, have go, stood before, can, can you? I, you stood before. Yeah, I stood yeah. before and lost, yeah, oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, is this is uh, an, tonight's an audition <laughs> again. For but, uh, no, the, the point I'm, I would just make on your question is, it's a, it's a week, Farron, yes. it's a week, no, well, I was going to, just on the supplementary question, it's oh, right. a week since we emerged from the general election, completely knackered, to be blunt, uh, and I don't think it's sensible to make snap decisions. It's a big decision, not only for me, but for my wife and family, uh, and for others around us, and I want to make the right decision, not jump to a decision too quickly. Uh, was he treated uh, unfairly? 
uh, uh, he's, he's accepted that, uh, he, uh, that the press had the right to ask him questions. Uh, once he'd given an answer, uh, it did seem uh, excessive that they kept on and on asking him again. And I felt, in the end, desperately sorry for him. He, he, he I think, was tortured. Uh, and there is conflict within all of us, let's be honest about it. Uh, and I think he found it extraordinarily difficult and, and I think he's made a dignified decision at the end of it. Right. But one thing I just want to be absolutely clear on is that there does have to be a very clear message that goes out to any gay young person, perhaps a, a, a teenager who's being bullied at school. Uh, the message has to go out that you are who you are and you will re be respected for who you are and you can love who you want to love and you will not be treated as if you have committed a sin. P treat people with respect and dignity for who they are, not on the basis of who they love. All right. <laughs> I, may, I, have to, I, I may not be able to get all round the table on this one because time's running out. Rob? Yeah, did the press treat him unfairly? Uh, yes, because the press treats everyone unfairly. And if you <laughs> want to be the leader of a political party, you have to understand that that's in your job description. So it was probably the right decision for him to quit. And, and living as a committed Christian being incompatible uh, with leading the Liberal Democrats? Well, it so happens, like most people here, I've read the Bible and I've never found the part where Jesus said you shouldn't kiss another dude if you want to. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Laura, very briefly, a sentence or two only, please. Well, I, I, think, I think Tim Farron was forced out because he was a Christian. This was a nasty, anti-Christian campaign. <laughs> Um, I, 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 at the time, I wrote it, and I, I don't share Tim Farron's political views at all. And when I saw the people round upon him in a very unseemly, undignified campaign, in, in, in a very bullying way to force him out, I, I just thought it was shameful. I think it's been, uh, I think it's been so unfair on okay. him, and, and I just don't think it's right. Tobias? Well, I think Parliament is only as good, uh, and indeed government, as the people that actually want to stand and be part of that parliament. And I don't know whether the behaviour here will put more people off, but I absolutely agree that in this context, I'm a Christian, and I'm very pleased that it was our party that brought in the same-sex marriage uh, laws and indeed the, the Turing laws uh, uh, as well. Ground. With the Liberal Democrats <laughs> as well, absolutely, with the coalition. <laughs> but, all right, all right, unity. Emily. I think it was. I think that you cannot aspire to be prime minister of this country, which is what Tim Farron was trying to do, and think that they, a substantial minority of the of this country, by their very sexuality, are in some way immoral. I think that you you also have to make sure that 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 what you say publicly is what you believe privately. And I know plenty of Christians who fully understand that a woman should have the right to be able to choose an abortion, that people should, be, that sh people should not be treated in any other way for being gay. You know, there are plenty of Christians involved in, in, uh, in politics. It is not Christians being picked on. And quite frankly, listening to a conservative woman saying that Christians are picked on in particular ought to remember the way they treated Sadiq. Uh, they remember treated Sadiq Park and attacked him for right. being a Muslim. Angra, Angra, let's come back to you. Angra Dunkley, what do you think? Yeah, I think he was treated very unfairly, especially when his actual voting record exactly. showed that yeah. he was one of the most liberal yeah. and pro-gay rights MPs out there. Why didn't he make a distinction right. between what is legal, illegal, what the Liberal Democrat policy is, and what's a sin, which is very private matter? I mean, so, you know, some sin, uh, avarice is, is a sin in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, Glutton is a sin. I mean, just, can I just um, say that? I, there, I, there are things that are but, sins but, which aren't necessarily, have nothing to do with the it's law. It's not for it? people to say what is sinful. I, I honestly don't think... That's what he was asked about all the time. No, no but it, it's not That's human. the dilemma if he was on, If he you're a religious say, person, human... It, it, yes. We would say, it's not whether you are deeming something to be sinful. You're not in judgment over anybody. That, that was that the point he was making sinful. all the way through. It's how his interpretation yes. of what might be right. sinful. And it was an entirely a private... He, people were literally interrogating interrogating him over his conscience. It was absolutely exactly. outrageous interrogation. Thank you very much. He he He's been consistent throughout Our in the way he's up. voted. Our time Yes, thank you very much. So, we see the competition and we'll see whether you... <laughs> we'll be back here for a leadership special for the... How many Liberal Democrats are there? There are 12 of us. 50% <laughs> <laughs> interest. We'll have you all back. <laughs> Our time's up, I'm afraid. I've been